We're talking about supernatural. You know, what I have observed taking place in um, the country is a, I, I find it to be a paradox. The, the people, I'm talking about rank and file person you run into are becoming more and more open, interested in the paranormal. It, we, we, we used to call it witchcraft, but now they have other names for it. And they're interested in being able to have psychic powers and telepathic powers and be able to tell the future and, and spiritual encounters. You know, over the last uh, decade and a half, there have been so many popular television shows nationally that have uh, dealt with uh, the, the dead before they cross over. They didn't understand what Paul said when he said, be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And this intermediate thing was fictional. They, they, someone else came with that. But, but folks become more and more open to the idea of the para, paranormal in the, in the world. But they look with more scrutiny when the church preaches supernatural intervention and divine healing and miracles and, and God changing people's lives, then that's considered to be a little bit far-fetched that God would do something supernatural, but they believe, quite frankly, that spiritualists can do the supernatural. It's just in church where you shouldn't expect. Well, the fact is, supernatural is, uh, is the calling card of the church. Jesus said, these signs, shall follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. This is the earmark of the church. This is the stamp of God's approval. And so in... Um, uh, the generation we live, we have people that have uh, lives that have been defamed and marked and scarred by the world. Um, I was um, at um, uh, Tommy Barnett's pastor school a number of years ago, and they had just opened in the last couple of years the Dream Center, and so they brought a group of the uh, members of that congregation in Los Angeles by bus over to the, the Phoenix uh, Pastor School and they made a, uh, they made a uh, uh, line, it was a greeting line. When we came into service on Tuesday morning, there's about 50 of these recently converted people just delivered from alcohol, from drug addiction, uh, the, the ways of the world, I mean, these, these were uh, uh, people that had been living on the edge and now they're converted and brought into household faith. And they made a line up the greeting committee, like you come into the church and you walk through the line. And I, I've come into churches and have a couple of deacons shake my hand when I came in or a couple of ushers shake my hand when I came into the church, you know. But uh, here we met these guys that had just got off motorcycles and had their leathers and and on, I came down there and I, wa I saw the, the scars on their face and, the, and um, uh, their face showed a hard life already, though these were relatively young people. But they were so victorious and delivered and set free. And I came through and I was walking with Jim Wright coming through and we shook the people's hand. They, they didn't, all of them shake it. They want to give you a high five, you know. He said, come through that line and. Rushed through, we, cut, we got in the door, and I looked at Jim, and Jim, brother, I looked at me. He said, what do you think about that? I said, I think I'm going to go back and go through that line again. That's the way to come to church, you know. But um, it, just a few days, weeks before, these, this line of people, their life had been useless. They had no hope, no future, no plan. They were just waiting for the grave. But there had been supernaturally value added to their life. You hear me? 
It wasn't done by a uh, human method. It was not concocted by a earthly plan. Divine intervention had added value supernaturally to these people's lives. I'd like for you to look at the book of Romans with me this morning, chapter number 8. The book of Romans, chapter number 8. Let's begin reading here with verse number 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Then, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would add your unction as we speak this word today. Help us, Lord, to say those sayings that will bring honor and glory to Jesus' holy name and edification to the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we ask, amen and amen. I'll tell you, when we come into Christ, this is a supernatural change that takes place in our lives. We talked about the new birth a couple of weeks ago. But I want to talk to you today a little bit about what God does to a, an individual's life when he is translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, God's own son. First thing I want you to see is God said, I knew it. I knew it. When we got into the kingdom of God, God was not surprised you're born because you're born in the kingdom of God because you decided to but you didn't surprise God when you accepted he knew you he knew who you were he knew what problems that you had the enemy would like to load you down with condemnation as if you did some things that God wasn't prepared for but when God made plans to save you he knew exactly what he was going to save you out of he knew you he knew you he knew your heart. And though the enemy would like to tell you that God uh, can't use you or God has made you a second-class citizen, the fact is, according to the Word of God, he knew exactly where you would come from, what it would take to get you out of your bondage and set your feet on the high road. He knew who the ones were that were going to resist him, and he knew who the ones were that were going to embrace him. Now, the story is told about these twins. And before they were born, God said, the younger is going to be blessed above the elder. And uh, there was a big thing in those days, of course, about the birthright, the firstborn. These, two, these twins would be born, but the one that was going to be born first would be servant to the one born second. And so Paul says, isn't that interesting? Before these children had been born before they had drawn a breath before they had said a word God had decided to put favor on one rather than on the other Jacob have I loved but Esau have I rejected how could God do that if God is a fair God it's because God foreknew God knew the heart of Esau that would disdain the things of the spirit and the birthright and he knew the heart of Jacob that would cherish it and cling to the blessings and the favor of God. Therefore, he chose Jacob over his brother Esau. And Jacob became Israel and the father of the nation of Israel. Pre-known by God. I want to just let you add this value to your own estimation. You know, big problem some people have is with having a, uh, a proper sense of self-worth. 
some people come across as being highly uh, conceited or, or very arrogant when the real problem is they feel inferior and they're overcompensating and it comes across in a wrong, uh, in a wrong light. But I want to add some value in your own mind. You, you have turned your heart to Jesus. That was not a surprise to God. God knew you. God knew your heart. And it, when it comes to the failures that the enemy would like to lay against you, God understands what you were faced with. Now consider this. The Apostle Paul, the man who wrote over half the books of the New Testament, began his life as being a persecutor of the church. He went about not only dis, uh, discrediting Jesus, but persecuting those people that would follow him. But he says in his writings, I, I found mercy because I did it ignorantly. I didn't understand what I was doing. God knew him. He knew his heart. He knew that when the light of the gospel came to this Saul of Tarsus, that he would receive such a uh, complete revolutionary change in his life that he would pour his life into the work of the ministry as no other man ever did. And because of that, he had that special grace of the encounter on the Damascus Road. When the Lord Jesus actually appeared to him and called him out of that life of blindness into the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because God knew him. He knew his heart. I want to tell you today, your heart has been uh, turned to Jesus. That is, you understand that Jesus is the only son of the only God. And you understand that on a mission, Jesus came from glory to earth, took on the form of a man. He lived a sinless life. And anointed by the Holy Spirit, he performed miracles confirming himself to be the Messiah, his life was taken in the hands of vile men and he laid his life down as a ransom for us all. He rose up from the dead that he might become the firstborn among a church. And when he gave his life as he did, you embrace that truth. God has predestined you to be transformed into the likeness of his dear son. This is his plan for you, not to be covering over your mistakes and failures, but translating you out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. You that he's known, he has predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And he has called you to a special calling not only has he get put a call upon your life, but he's done a great work in you that the uh, naysayers, the, uh, the deniers uh, cannot wrestle against. The work is called justification. Now, if you go to a seminary, they'll discuss justification and they'll write volumes on it. But there's a very simple way to understand what it means when Paul says, I've been justified in Christ. It means I've been made just as if I'd never sinned. If you have been called by God, you have been justified through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a matter that you have simply been pardoned, but you have been completely renewed to the place that you're totally innocent as if no crime had ever been committed. He's adding value to your life. He's doing it supernaturally. He's changing your past. He's rewriting your life today. Adding value to you, and that's a supernatural work. And he says, those that I have justified, him have I, well, have I also glorified. Now, there is... Um, a, a, a narrow um, line that we walk here because I want you to understand that no one of us here today claims to be um, infallible. But I want to tell you, God has put glory in your life. 
He has saved you. He has called you. He has justified you and glorified you. It's like what John was saying in his epistle, third chapter, when he said, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. Everybody, I want you to look around. These people that you're sitting with, these are special people. We don't say this to be exclusionary. We want to be enfolding. We want to leave the ties out. We're wanting to bring people in. But I want to tell you that when God has put his hand upon your life, when you've been saved by his blood, when you've been justified by his, through his resurrection, also been glorified, Beloved, we are now the children of God. He's called us to a higher calling. He's called us to a higher uh, walk. And uh, because of that today, we sense that supernaturally and spiritually, God has elevated us to another walk. Listen to this. God is on your side. You know, Job was having a great deal of difficulty. I, I, I have confessed to this congregation many times that I love the book of Job, but I find it overwhelming. There's so much in it that I cannot get my mind to wrap all the way around it. But I, I do understand a few of the things that grip Job's heart, especially during his, his time of testing. And he was being tested, and he said, I just wish that there was a, and, and the best I can understand that to, to help us to, un, to understand it today, he was calling for a man that would be a, a referee, someone that would stand between him and God, someone that could help him understand a little better what God wanted from him and someone that would plead his cause to God. He felt so rejected in his, his poverty now. He's lost all of his wealth and even his family is gone and his health is gone and he's sick. He takes a piece of broken pottery and scratches at the lesions in his body and he said, I just wish somebody could stand between me and God and, and, and plead my case with God. Feel like God's against me and I don't know why. I don't know what God wants from me. Well, I will tell you, in our test, we often feel just exactly like Job felt. Like, Job, why am I? Or rather, we say like Job felt. Why am I like this, God? Why am I in this situation? We said somebody would stand between me and plead my case with God. Then we find out that, in fact, God is on our side. God is for us. And if God is for us, no one can be against us. Now, I want to close with this today uh, I understand that there are people who have so thoroughly lost their sense of self-worth they do not invest in their future because they do not see that their future has any promise or value to them they do not consider themselves to be um, worthy of any kind of consideration. They have lost a sense of dignity. They've lost uh, any sense of, of, uh, of, of, of humanity, and they have become debased in their own mind. This is the result of the progression of the sinfulness of men. The first chapter of the book of Romans, Paul explains what happened. 
as men uh, cease to retain the knowledge of God, how they become debased in their own mind and eventually lose their integrity until things that maybe one time we would have considered ourselves not capable of certain ways of life becomes normal to us. We, we need to understand exactly what it is that God has invested in you. I uh, was one day going to, uh, we, the, we had a man in church wanted to uh, get some transportation for the, the young people, the youth in the church. And he, he told me he'd heard about a, a, a co-op that was having an auction, some surplus material, and he had a couple of vans and said, well, let's go down and see if we can get a van for the, for the teenagers. And so we went down, traveled a long ways, went down to this auction he'd heard about, and they took off bidding on everything. We came to the vans while they bid. He bid for a while and then quit. And we didn't get one. Turned around, got in the car, started back for Bigsby. He's out of van. He said, you know, I really hate an auction. He t here he turned me halfway across the state to go to this auction. Got me up before the sun came up. Drove down there. And on the way back, he says, I really hate an auction. I said, well, why do you hate an auction? He said, at an auction, you've got to want something more than anybody else in that whole place to buy it. And I said, well, that's, that's really true. Because everything goes to the highest bidder. If you want to know what something is worth, you can put a price on it. You always hear about the manufacturer's suggested retail price. But that price means nothing at all unless someone is willing to pay that price. And so I've had people tell me about their art collections that were worth lots and lots of money. But that's only in their mind. That might be what it would cost to buy it, but that's no sign that anyone would be willing to give that for it. If you, you follow what I'm saying to you. What I'm telling you is the worth of anything is only what someone is willing to pay for it. And so let me tell you about you. When you were lost in trespasses and sin, when you were not worth, The king of the universe made a bid that was so high that he would never have to wonder if anyone could outbid him. When you were so lost that you could never find your way, God paid the bid for you that will never be matched when he said, I will give my only begotten son. And because of that, I want to tell you, it supernaturally changed your value, your worth. What God has invested in you makes you worth more than any counteroffer the devil can ever make. He has bought you with a price that no one can ever match and by that you belong to him